we had quoted the Mishnah at Pirkei Avos, which tells us that God tested Avram with 10 tests. Now, let's understand what is a test we call a challenge. A test is a test to test a person's, as they say, one's metal. If something is beyond the person's capacity, it's not a test. The example I always give, Max the person can lift 200 pounds and you say, let's see if you can lift a thousand pounds. It's not a test. It's beyond the person's capacity. A test is a test only if it's within your capacity and the question is, are you going to put yourself out there and apply yourself to meet the maximum, your maximum capacity? Or you'll choose to underestimate your own ability, and therefore you pass on it. Despite the fact you know your responsibility, for whatever reason, you put it in your own, you frame it as you choose, and you pass on it. That's a test. Whatever way you justify it, not to do it. One meets the test, beats the challenge, meaning that if it's presented, it's within my capacity and I will meet it head on. Other person says, it's not really that important. Or he says, it's beyond my capacity and people delude themselves. And therefore we walk away. But factually, you failed. Because it was within your capacity to achieve it. I'll give you an example, very simple. Person takes a course and you have to study for the exam. He has the aptitude that if he studies for the exam, he will get a passable grade, even an exceptional grade, even a perfect score. He chooses not to study. If you don't study, you don't have sufficient understanding or retention of the information, person's gonna fail. So why did he fail? Because he chose not to study, but why didn't you study? Because either he didn't think about not studying will cause you to fail, and even if I fail, somehow we're gonna work it out. So a person puts it in his own frame to be able to process that situation, why he chooses to be laid back or to evade the issue. That's failing a challenge. Every test that we're tested would not be a test if it's beyond that capacity. So whatever we're confronted in life with, it clearly tells you it's within your capacity to meet the challenge. Otherwise, it's, it's beyond the challenge. You definitely will fail. So what is God trying to prove? God is trying to prove, to test your dedication to him. Will you give it your best or won't you give it your best? That's what it's about. But if it's beyond your best, it's not a challenge. It's beyond your challenge. But I'll give you an example where something could be beyond your challenge, but if presented, you still do your best. We read about Avram is informed by God that God will destroy Sodom. And Sodom was the main metropolis, but there were four other communities. There were five cities that were going to experience cosmic destruction. There's no trace of those communities in existence, that they ever existed. And the moment Avram hears of this, he immediately enters into a very serious dialogue with God. And he says, maybe the 50 devoutly righteous people in these communities and the merit of 50 righteous, you'll spare the communities. God says, there, no, there aren't 50. He says, what, maybe they're 45. God says, there are no 45. Maybe they're 40. Maybe they're 30. And he keeps going down and down. God keeps responding. There aren't. 
He says, maybe they're 10, they're not 10. Therefore, there's no worthiness. Therefore, they'll be destroyed. But why did Avram initially enter into the challenge? If God said he's going to destroy them, it's fait complete. Who do you, where do you have the audacity to question God's decision? So we had said this many times. We find at the time of the sin of the golden calf, which was idolatry, which was seemingly unforgivable, God says to Moshe, allow me to destroy them. Allow me. So Moshe Rabbeinu hears those words, he says. If you want to destroy them, destroy them. Why are you asking me that I should allow you? So that statement indicates that it's within my ability to actually stay the execution. Because otherwise, what are you telling me? Allow me. You're God. You're the one who makes that decision. Evidently, I have the ability to intervene to maybe to evoke the attribute of mercy that they should not be destroyed. So God gave him a hinter that it's not a fate complete, that there's a chance that we could stay the execution, but you have to intervene. You have to plead on the behalf and supplicate me for mercy. Avram Avino, here's God's comes to, to Avram and says, I will destroy them. Avram asks himself a question. If you're going to destroy them, why are you informing me? What relevance does it have to me? You want to destroy them, destroy them. Has no relevance to me. Evidently, if you're sharing that with me, evidently, I have something to say about it. Maybe if I take up the cause and I plead the case, maybe I'll be able to stay the execution. Because otherwise, why are you sharing it with me? So Avram immediately read the script as I'm explaining it and immediately enters into a dialogue. Maybe the 50 tzaddikim. But what was Avram's concern? Avram's concern, why he took up the issue, initially, why he, he actually debated this point very strongly, because he says to God, what do people say? You brought the great flood upon the world. Were they really that evil? Evidently, there must have been devoutly righteous people there, except God, when your wrath comes about, you just with one swoop, you destroy the righteous and the Culpable. You don't discern between the good and the evil. You just destroy them all. And that itself is called the Chil Hashem. That perception is perceiving God as cruel. How does God destroy the good with the evil? So Avram was concerned when he destroyed Sodom. People say, God's up to his old tricks again. Is it possible they know devoutly righteous? And he's destroying these five communities. So Avram entered into the dialogue to determine that they're no righteous. And that's where he started, maybe they're 50 righteous. If that's the case, if God says they're not, okay, so God is going public on why he's destroying them, that they don't have the worthiness to be spared. So God says, Avram says, but maybe they're 45, maybe they're 40, maybe they're 10. He says, they're not even 10. They have no worthiness. So by going through this exercise of question and response, he's making it public knowledge known that the reason why they're being destroyed is because they have no saving grace. And therefore God is destroying them. So this is automatically, again, a reflection on the generation of the great flood. Why did he destroy them? Because they were not righteous, sufficiently righteous. They were all evil. And therefore, they all have liability, culpability. That's where they were destroyed. So again, Avram read the script. Avram thought he could make a difference. But at the end of the day, he couldn't make a difference. But So what was the, what was the challenge for Avram? That that he's coming and taking initiative that there should not be a chil Hashem. Not that they should be spared. Avram says, I don't know how this is going to play out. But one thing I know, at the end of the day, if he will destroy them, it'll become public knowledge that God will not be perceived as a cruel being. He won't be perceived as that. So taking the initiative 
That's called meeting the challenge. Rather than saying, well, if they're, they're evil, just destroy them. But what if there's a consideration? Am I concerned about God's glory? That God's glory will be besmir besmirched. That was the test. That was a test over there. And he met the challenge. Although the answer was no, it doesn't make a difference. But going through that exercise of presenting your case and God responding, that clarifies and elucidates the fact that God is equitable in his justice. That's the understanding. Avram was tested with 10 tests. There, he succeeded, and he met every challenge. And he met, at first challenge, he was presented with another challenge. And I always say, if he would have started with the Akeda, which was the most difficult, the son that was born to him when he was 100 years old, the son that he loved, who believed that he was going to be his successor, and he was told by God he would be his successor. He's the future of existence. And God says it. 37 years later, bring him up as a burnt offering. This is a difficult one. Avram says, uh, you know, I'd like some clarification on this one. If he's supposed to, you promised me, he's the future. He's my successor. And he will meet the objective of creation. But if I slaughter him as a burnt offering, there is no future. How do we reconcile both statements? Avram himself, did not ask the question to God. Why didn't he ask the question? Because factually speaking, if you believe in God and understand who God is, God does not renege on anything he says. But you have a question. You have a problem. How do you reconcile both statements? You know what the answer is? That's my problem. That's not God's problem. If God is truth on an absolute level, there is no contradiction. It's only in my limited understanding, because I'm a finite being, I can't reconcile the two. But what about, I want to know. But you wanting to know has no relevance with God's absoluteness of truth. That was the challenge. Do I allow my ego to rear its head and say, but I must know. But you must knowing automatically is a, a reflection that you're not negated to God, understanding God is absolute in truth, and there's no reason to ask the question. And it's beyond your capacity. That was the challenge of the Akeda. The challenge of the Akeda was not, do I slaughter my son? Don't I slaughter my son? The challenge of the Akeda was, does Avram ask the question? And ask for some kind of reconciliation between the first statement and the second statement. That was the challenge. Avram, you know, in life, we grow. We grow from experiences. Nobody's born at tzaddik. You start at one level, and as you develop and you mature and you read the script correctly, you begin, you begin getting an understanding of truth and who God is and what life's all about. But if a person would be confronted with, at the young age, where a, man, a person who's 60 years old is confronted with, It'd be beyond his capacity. He couldn't deal with it. Because he hasn't gone through the various stages of development to be able to deal with that greater challenge. Avram was only able to deal with the greatest challenge because he learned from the track record of God between the two of them who God is. Now that I understand who God is, in real time, now I'm ready to meet the greatest challenge, which is the Akedah. Because this is literally a contradiction. A can, the contradiction would seemingly cannot be reconciled. But he doesn't ask the question. You've succeeded. That indicates you're totally negated. Who am I to ask? Not because I'm not going to get an answer. You know, the State Department makes a decision to go to war. You as a citizen say, you'll why don't you consult with me? It's absurd. They should consult with you. Who are you? You're less than a speck on the spectrum. But I'm a citizen. It has no relevance to you. Do you understand you have no say in the matter? And you don't count. 
and therefore you're not to be reckoned with. But Avram originally was promised, and God has direct communication with him. I have a right to know. But understand who God is, you have no right. You are the subject. You are negated to God. Besides, understanding God is truth. As we say, the signal of God is truth. And there's never, even as much as something infinitesimal compromising that truth, you have no need for an answer. You just follow the script. It'll play out. And after it plays out, you will see there's no contradiction as what was the end result. God says, I never told you to slaughter him. I told you to bring him up as a burnt offering, meaning to bind and put him on the altar and then take him off. I never told you to slaughter him. That was the reconciliation between the first and second statement. But Avram understood it initially the way God wanted to understand it. Bring him up as an offering means and slaughter him and burn his remains. So later it played out. He understood exactly why it wasn't a contradiction. But these are the challenges. The challenges are only challenges. Only if what? If you have the capacity to deal with it. Avram had the capacity. And therefore, it was a test. But the level of trust you have to have and the level of love that you have to have, which we discussed in a moment. Of course, we say because he withstood the 10th test, he's referred to as Oavi. Avram is the beloved of God. Because Avram loves God. Of course, you cannot withstand that kind of test and go through what he went through unless you have this unlimited level of love for your creator. And because he did, therefore, he was able to withstand every one of the 10 tests. The, to bring this point to that level, I once mentioned the name of the Morale of Prague, says something phenomenal. The Gemara tells us in Brochos, Tracti Brochos, I've said this in the past a number of times, but it's profound what he says, the morale of Prague. It's in his commentary on, is on Pirkei Ovos. Greater is a person who benefits from the handiwork of his hands than a person who has fear of God. God a person who has benefit, literally means pleasure, from the handiwork of his hands is greater than a person who fears God. So the obvious question is, person is a ditch digger, and he earns a salary, self-sufficient, self-supporting, and you have a person who fears God at an exceptional level. The ditch digger because he benefits from the handiwork of his own hands, he's greater than this, the greatest person who fears God. The one who fears God, how do we understand that? How is that possible? A person is part of a cleaning crew. He cleans the office building from one to three in the morning with his dust mop because he's a self-earner. He's greater than the person who fears God. How, does, how, does, how do we understand this? So the way I in this so it was this way. That the person who earns his own keep, he also fears God. And you have another person who fears God, even at a more advanced level. But he's supported by others. He's not a self-supporter. The one who is a self-supporter, his level of fear of God, although maybe at a lesser level, has greater value than the other person. When I'm explaining that was not the way the Merrill project explains it. I'm going to explain tell you in a moment. So how, why is that? A person who's supported by others, as a human being, every decision I make, somebody has something to say about it. Why? Because since I'm dependent on their support, at a certain subconscious level, I, I take everything into consideration before I make any decision. So not only is God dictating to me, but all those who 
contribute to my support, they're also dictating to me. Because if they're not satisfied with my behavior, my support is in jeopardy. But the person who is self-supporting, he says, look, I only have one master. That's God. To me, it's irrelevant what anybody thinks. As long as I know I'm doing the right thing, what God wants, I carry the torch. I carry the baton. That's the understanding. Great is the one who benefits from his own handiwork than the one who fears God, meaning, and he's supported by others. That's the way I understood it. Amaral Prague explains it differently. He explains it this way. The two levels of service of God. There's, there's a mitzvah, positive commandment to fear God. Fear God means not only out of due to punishment, but it means reverence, to revere God. What does reverence mean? Reverence means that because you understand and appreciate who God is, you revere him. You negate it to his will. I always give the example. Reverence is awe. Awe is fear. Why is there fear? Why, is, why does awe cause fear? Because a person's sense of self is based on his sense of accomplishment and value. But if you cannot hold up a candle to whoever you're relating to, because whatever that person is, your level of accomplishment is negated and reduced to almost zero. So what is your sense of value? You have no sense of value. The moment you lose your sense of value, there's fear. That's why a person who truly has awe, reverence, you have fear. The fear is not because the person is going to harm you. It's because you have no sense of self. You've lost your sense of self. That's awe. A person who has awe for God, reverence for God, God is the infinite being, omnipotent being. Whatever you are, it's, inf it's less than infinitesimal compared to what God is. As we say every morning, all the wise, as if you have no, you were born without intelligence. The insightful, as if you know nothing compared to God. Could you imagine a person is a Nobel Prize winner in any area. And now he's going to stand up to King Solomon and stand in his presence. King Solomon is the wisest man ever lived. And based on the Midrash, it says his wisdom was like the sand on the beaches. What does that mean? That if you take all the wise men of the Jewish people and combine them, encapsulate them on one side of the scale, and you put King Solomon on the other side of the scale, his genius would outweigh them. This is unfathomable genius. It's bordering on divine. And a person believes, you know, he belongs to the Mensa Club. No. He gets himself a genius. When he stands in the presence of King Solomon, you feel worthless. You're not worth the food you eat. Your existence has no value. And when you feel that way, you feel worthless, your sense of worth, tremendous fear comes upon you when you stand in the presence of this person. So there's a mitzvah to fear God, to revere God. But there's a mitzvah to love God. Love is greater than fear because love is something positive. Fear is a recognition of the difference between one party versus the other. And the other party is so overwhelming, the other party is negated to the greater. Love is much more than that. You motivate it. Awe means I wouldn't dare cross that line because of who you are. But love is another understanding. You're motivated. It doesn't create refrain. It 
motivates you to do something positive. That's that's love. Love is a motivating factor. So the morale of Prax says this. A person earns a pittance, barely enough to, to live on. And the person every night feels undernourished, malnourished because of this, and fatigued, and has hunger pangs. And this person reveres God, and somebody comes to him and says, would you like I should give you something more than you have? He says, of course. To alleviate my malnourishment, my hunger pangs, and my fatigue. Of course I would. So he says, do you think God would mind? He says, no. I mean, I don't question God why he didn't do it. Because that's reverence. But if I'm able to compensate myself, of course I would want it. What about a person who loves God? If a person truly loves God at that exceptional level, if you love God, you believe God loves you. If God truly loves you, why didn't he provide? Don't you provide for the one that you love? So why didn't God provide? Evidently, there's only one answer. Because it's not in my best interest that I should have more than I have. It's only to God's love. That's why I have this pittance, which causes me to go to bed hungry every night and feel mal mal malnourished and fatigued. That's due to his love. And you internalize that. Therefore, even though it's a pittance, you're able to see it and benefit from that. You see that in the context of benefit. I'm able to benefit from that. And if you'd want to give me, a third party wants to give me more than that, I will not accept it. Because if the one who loves me more than, surpasses any human love, doesn't provide, he could provide it, evidently it's not my best interest to have it. And that's only due to his love. Therefore, you will not accept it. If it's reverence, would you want more? Of course, I would want more. Do I question God? Of course not. Because I revere God. But the person who loves God, and he's only loving God because he perceives God as God loves him on an unlimited level. So why is he providing? It's due to his love for me. Therefore, I don't want more. And I'm able to benefit because I put it in a context, this is in my best interest. So I can benefit even from the pittance. The example I have, a person is a serious diabetic. And he goes with his wife to, to be hosted. And the person, the host puts all kinds of food on the table. And whenever the husband wants to take some, the wife stops him. So the host says, the wife is controlling the husband. This, I've never seen anybody so hempecked, so controlled. Because the person doesn't realize that the person has a condition. And if he ingests too, much, too many carbohydrates, he can go into diabetic shock. But the wife, because she loves her husband and she wants him to be healthy and live, she denies him that. More than the minimum is detrimental to him. And the husband understands that. And if he understands that it's rooted in his wife's love for him, he doesn't get upset when his wife denies him what he would want to take. And if he's smart, he doesn't even make an effort to take it because, or she doesn't bring it into the house. It's out of love, not because I'm denying you. Somebody says, would you like I should bring that? No. Why not? Because it's not my best interest. And my wife keeps that out of the house because she loves me. God gives you less and it's barely survivable only because he loves us. But why is that a manifestation of his love? We have no idea. 
It's like the diabetic. We have no idea. But it's in our best interest. I'll give you the example. Because Avraham Avinu withstood the 10 tests. The fruits that he was able to harvest due to those 10 tests, as we'll discuss, were the 10 plagues in Egypt, were the 10 commandments. It was all in merit of those 10 tests. So being put on the chopping block and put, put in that vise and being challenged to such a degree, that was the ultimate. So that that I'm turned, twisting your arm is in your best interest. There's a famous story. It was known. Rambam, Maimonides, Moshe ben Maimon was the greatest physician in his time and ever since that. He was one of the greatest physicians in the history of the world. Rambam. And he had a colleague who lived in Egypt, who was also a great one from the earlier commentators of the Torah. His name was Ibn Ezra. Ibn Ezra, he has a commentary on the Torah. And Ibn Ezra had a very difficult life. And he had an eye ailment where ultimately he didn't realize it was going to lead to blindness. But the Rambam, being a doctor, understood. And the only way he would be able to be able to heal and prevent this from happening, he had to cry copious tears to wash out the tear ducts, to wash out whatever bacteria or blockages in those tear ducts. Otherwise, it would lead to blindness. The Rambam invites him. They weren't really intimate friends. Or maybe they were. And the Rambam creates a scenario which causes him a level of grief and pain and embarrassment that he doesn't say what's going on. He doesn't say, what's, why is my mind is doing this to me? I mean, as it is, he's down and out. Of course, his faith wasn't great in the material sense. On top of that, Keeps on me all this abuse and he just broke down crying and he couldn't control himself. And he cried for hours. And the Rambam just, just ignored him, which is totally out of character. And after he cried so many hours, Rambam gives him some cloth with some solution on it. He says, wipe your eyes. And now I'm going to tell you what it's all about. And he explained to him that if he wouldn't have cried the way he cried, God forbid, the end result was it was bordering on turning, becoming fully blind. So that that he did what he did was out of love, not that he wanted to cause him pain. But who understood that? The Rama being that special physician, he understood it. The patient, he saw himself as a victim. When God does anything to us, if you have love for God, God forbid you're never a victim. It's in our best interest. And if you understand it's rooted in God's love for us, you never ever question. And even if somebody would want to change your, your predicament, you don't want to change. Because if God chose to write the script as he wrote it, I don't want the script changed. Because if God loves me, and I understand he loves me. But you can only understand if you love God because he loves you, then you don't want more than what he's provided. Love of love, the midst of love is greater than the midst of, of reverence. And that's what it means. God of Yosemi If you're able to have pleasure, benefit from the earnings, although it's a pittance, not even survivable, you're greater than the person who fears God. Because that's a confirmation on your love for God. Because you don't, you're able to benefit only because you understand that's in your best interest to have less rather than more. That's how the Baral of Prague explains the passage of the Talmud. So what I said was, we say, and I mentioned this two days in a row, the Talmud tells us every day there's a heavenly voice that goes out from 
Sinai that announces to the world, the whole world is sustained in the mayor of Reb Hanin Mendoza, who he, his subsistence is Kav Charubin, a small measure of carob from Friday to Friday. Should die lo Kav Charubin. It doesn't say he eats a small measure of carob from Friday to Friday. It's sufficient. It's sufficient for him. He doesn't want more than that. But how does he survive it? How could he be content with that? How could it be sufficient? You know what the answer is? That's only an expression of his love for God at that exceptional level. And because he fulfilled the mitzvah of love for God at the exceptional level, in that merit, the whole world was supported in his merit for that reason. God says, Tavrob, because you were able to meet the 10 challenges. You love me. Because you could only have met those 10 challenges if you saw that I love you. So his own love was a reflection of God's love because otherwise the person wasn't able to meet the challenge as he met the challenge. 